Okay. Thank you, Jill. Will, is it all good how my slides are for you? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. It is such an honor to be here, I have to tell you. Um, and kind of all of you, you know, it's just like, I hope I do a good job. Today, my talk is going to be very non-basic for the basic scientists. Focusing on my research that I've done where I've, I've incorporated environmental change um, into hopefully helping people to be more active or um, with weight loss. So I love your campus. I will say that Virginia Tech is the, is the most beautiful campus, but um, that's coming from our drill field. Um, and I just like to show that photo, but we both have great campuses. So I call this prevention of obesity, diabetes and obesity across the lifespan. Gonna not do the entire lifespan. I need to tell you that right now. But I've done work with mineral supplementation, and I still do. I love magnesium. My students joke because I like think it's the best mineral ever, even though there are plenty of good minerals. I also do sort of that diet and exercise and education. But today I'm going to focus on this environmental change piece of my research. So we all know that diet and exercise influence energy balance, and one of my earlier studies that um, I'm going to start with that is not environmental change, it's sort of the diet and exercise one, was one that um, I, way back when, when I was at UMass. And so what I did was it was the effect of diet alone, exercise alone, and diet plus exercise on weight loss. And we studied all these parameters, but because of time, you're going to notice I'm going to focus mostly on body weight and BMI. And so for this one, we're just going to talk about body weight and changes in body weight. But what did we do? So we had 90 overweight sedentary women and men, and they were about 44 years old, and their BMI was right around 31. We randomly assigned them, and we did it by stratifying their BMI, which means that we made sure that not everybody with a high BMI got into the diet only group. So we had to stratify them when we randomized them and then made sure that we evenly distributed them through the three groups. So we had the diet only group where I sort of taught them about diet and met with them frequently and it was sort of like weekly, then monthly, and then then kind of fades off. And then the diet plus exercise group got diet plus exercise. And the exercise group and the diet plus exercise group, there we go. Um, this is magic. So um, I will do this This again. Let's just see. Oh, there he goes. Okay. I'm glad this happens at other places and not just at Virginia Tech because it's so warning for me. So it really is. Thank you. Um, the exercise group, if you can remember Nordic tracks, those are these machines that people feed on. So that's who sponsored this study. And we either gave them, well, well, first of all, they came to us initially, and it's okay that that's doing that for now. But if they if they came to us initially and we had to build them up to exercise. So many of you in this room I know have done supervised exercise uh, studies and you know how intense they are. So you have to offer like, three times a day, five days a week. And we built them up for three days a week all the way up to five days a week. And then finally they were like 30 minutes a session. And after six months, we sent them home with the Nordic track. And it wasn't to promote Nordic track, not because they funded it. I wanna make sure you all know that that didn't bias me um, because you'll see the results. <laughs> and so, um, but it was more, did this machine that was whole body help them with more weight? And so you can imagine, right? What did we think? Diet plus exercise should have done the best. So apparently it doesn't like this slide, but after after um, six months of training, we did nine and 12 month follow-ups. Let's see if it likes my next slide. Um, I think we'll quickly do this. So for women, you can see very typical and very sadly typical as they lost weight, which that's good in the diet and exercise group, lost the most weight, but recidivism happened in 12 months as we sort of almost always see. They leave us and then they go back. They would tell me, like, Stella, can't wait to exercise on my own. And I'd say, yes, but you have to exercise. So, like, they, they would show me photos of their cats sleeping on their Nordic tracks, et cetera. <laughs> they all ended up getting the Nordic track, by the way, even if they were the diet group, but not during the study. We found a very similar thing with the men. Um, what kind of worried me is that the diet group kept increasing regardless. I thought, what did I teach them that was so wrong? But regardless, that's that to lead me into saying that all of us know, we in this room, I'm preaching to the choir, diet and exercise, we know it's great for our health. But we also know that having accountability, supervision, et cetera, and being with people really helps. So um, what I, what that made me think about was, gosh, like 
I still want to change the world. And how can I change the world if every time someone's done with my study, they go back to what they were doing? And so I thought, well, let me think if I can change the environment that might be able to help with people doing things sort of passively, if you will. And so we know, like Jim Hill says, his first one, like affecting energy balance by only 100 kcals a day can really be a big change over time, right? If all of us minus 100 kcals every day, like we, we, we lose, what, what, about 700 calories a week, I can do my math, that's a pretty good uh, deficit without doing anything else. And we also know that diet is, even though we know that exercise is amazing, exercise is mostly for maintaining a healthy body weight, but not for losing body weight. So there's where I thought to myself, okay, I have a captive audience in a university. And what if I wrote a grant to say that I want to change the environment in the dining halls in the university to see if I can prevent weight gain except for your freshman? All of us know that as the freshman 15. So I thought, okay, let's let's go. Thank you so much. That was very magical of you. Thank you so much. So I basically said that already. And so again, well documented. We know that the decrease in PayPal's is bigger in weight loss than it is the exercise. So what was the purpose of this particular study? These studies that I named certain things, like I, they're just what we call them. That's not really what they're called, but we call this one the protein control study. And so what we did was we evaluated the effect of smaller portion sizes and providing smaller serving utensils in one dining hall versus another one being a control. And so again, measured a lot of different things in college age women and men, but we're just, I'm just going to show you body weight and body mass index. And a lot of things to share with you, especially with students, because I always love to share the trials and tribulations that we have, because it always seems like, you know, when people show you their research, it's so perfect. I can guarantee you none of mine is perfect. We measured them beginning and end of every semester for three semesters. They're not, not in the summer, fall, spring, and then fall again. And mostly they were freshmen, but we did have some transfer students. And we measured all these things, and glucometry, dietary intake, energy expenditure, et cetera. For some of the some of the students, we had to measure them like behind these curtains in the dining hall with like skin folds, et cetera, because that was just the best place to meet them. So some of this wasn't fancy. It was just we had to get the work done. So one dining hall control, the other was normal portion sizes. We actually did this at Rutgers University. If any of you know Rutgers, it's huge. So they have these, these sample sizes were stored in self-selected because one of them would they tended to go to one dining hall because they were in that part of the campus and the others went to the other. But when I met with the food service director, he said to me, well, we just changed the glasses to be bigger last year, so I'm not doing that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he goes, oh, we just did this, so I'm not going to. Okay. And he said, if I hear one complaint, you're out of here. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I just want you to know, like, I was like, then I walk out with my closet manager and I look at her and say, so we can't get in trouble. Like, oh, I, was like, I felt like I was going to get in big trouble, but they were amazing. But it was just so funny because he was this really big guy and so intimidating. I'm like, okay, I felt like I came out of the principal's office and I was in trouble. So what we did was we worked with the food. So first of all, the, the dining hall managers, right? Because they were the ones who knew about it. We kept it blinded from the food service employees because we didn't want them saying to somebody, you know, hey, you know, you're... Hey, oh, you, you, we can give you more portion sizes. I'm calling, I'm, I can't say his name as well, so I'm just calling him Owen. <laughs> right? He, he doesn't know that I'm talking to him. Okay. So, smaller serving sizes, for example, most of the foods overall were reduced by about 20%. And so, we had to work with the food service employees to actually change their habits. And you might think, oh, what a big deal. But if you're serving thousands of students a day, and you've been working there for 20 some years, and you have a habit of cutting things in 88 slices as opposed to 96, that's a change. So we had to really work with them. As you can see, I won't go through all of this, but to be, make them aware, but not to make them aware of why. So they kind of thought it was just the university wanted to make these portions smaller. And we also had smaller serving utensils that we put in the self-service areas. Students could still get as much as they wanted. So that was not a barrier at all because they were paying for this. There's no way we were going to stop that. This was a complete environmental change. There was no other intervention. We didn't have an exercise intervention. We did not want them to change their exercise. As a matter of fact, 
when they when we would ask them about those things, I would be like cringing when they say, yeah, I'm really trying to lose weight. And of course, I couldn't say a word. One of the cute things that happened is the two food service directors, the one who was going to be in the, the, the head of the control, the our control dining hall, she said, Bella, if you want, I can make our portion sizes bigger. <laughs> you know, for a nanosecond, it was like the devil on my shoulder saying, wouldn't that be great? I'm like, no, that would be a little unethical. I did not do that. But it was so adorable because she thought that could be very helpful. And I said, no, 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 you have to do your normal ones. So again, people remained blinded. The participants thought that they were in a study for health for students. And IRB approved. They monitored how these often these students came. And so if they came to the quote unquote, the dining hall, they should have come to less than 80% of the time we got them because we needed to make sure that they came there. Because mind you, right, all of you know this, that's not the only place they're eating. We are not, we couldn't control when they got something at midnight, you know, but we did take dietary records as you're going to see. So the other thing we did was sort of a, a way to process evaluate our measures is every so often we set up tables and like if you came in and you got the food, we just we wanted you to weigh the food before and after. Nothing, we didn't care what was on there. We just wanted a mount. And so if they went up again, they'd come back. And so we just kind of kept track of that just for our own sort of what I, as, as I said, process of our measure. We did, we collected dietary recalls twice per month. And we did this by phone interviews with my students to students, which was really good because then the students were extremely honest about everything they ate. They didn't worry that they were talking to a professor. They were talking to a, a, a peer and they didn't worry about how much they ate, how much they drank, et cetera. And then we just simply measured physical activity by step counts using, and then by the IPAC questionnaire. So basically just really basic results. We had about 115 students. We were hoping to get more, but we, we hit pretty close to what we wanted to get. Um, you could see the demographics very much matched what Rutgers was. And, this doesn't look great. And I'm telling you right now, it doesn't look great, but I'm gonna show you that it actually is better than it looks. And I'm not making up data. I'm not trying to be smoke and mirrors here. But we really didn't see weight changes in between the groups. But if we look at it one other way, because remember college students still are changing their BMI a bit. Still not the best. This is a P greater than 0.05. I'm not making it anything that it's not. It's not significant. But you can see that the intervention group kind of stayed flat and the control group kind of went up. Now, you can also argue that they started at a lower BMI. They started at about two kilograms per meter squared lower, but you could still see that they had a pretty big rate up. So what does this mean? I mean, it's, I'm not going to tell you that it, we were a little disappointed, but there are clinically significant changes. And those clinically significant changes uh, kind of go like this, right? First of all, with body weight, the intervention group had this initial increase of 0.9 kilograms, but they maintained it. They didn't increase it. Whereas the control group had an initial weight gain that kind of over time of 1.8 kilograms, and they kind of kept that there. And with body mass index, we saw this about 0.8% decrease. You couldn't really see it on that graph, but like a 0.8% decrease in BMI. And the control group had about 2% increase in their BMI. And you're still like, big deal. And it again, not trying to make it more than it is, it wasn't significant, but clinically here's why it matters. For about every 1% increase in BMI, desirable BMI, uh, women and men will increase the rate of the coronary heart disease by about three and a half percent. And for every kilogram of weight loss, there's reductions in coronary heart disease and diabetes. And finally, for every kilogram of weight gain after high school, CHD increases by about 6% for women and about 3% for men. So P is not less than 0.05, making that clear to you, but we still need to look at these changes and we still need to be aware of that we didn't find a great decrease, but that little bit of decrease can actually be effective over time for overall health for the long term. So it wasn't powered to evaluate these differences I put in a couple of grants afterwards, trying to follow them longer. They weren't funded, just for those of you who were talking to me today about not getting funded, that um, that, that, that the, it still gets very frustrating, but we still wanna take a look at this over a long period of time and we might just have to tweak it a bit to say, what are we gonna do differently, I think, so that we can do it over more of a long-term. I'd love to follow students up after college, but that is much more difficult to keep track of that. So I don't, I just wanna stop for a second. Do you normally wait to the end for questions? 
Okay, you prefer that? Or, cause I'm okay if you wanna ask now, but if you, I'll follow your rules. So I'll keep going. All right, all right. Okay, so this was a multi-center study that I had the privilege of being on and we called it the healthy study. If you see anything about that, that is not an acronym for anything. I just want you to know. People, every time we publish about it, they're like, so what's it stand for? Healthy, that's like, that's it. Like it, it, it literally stands for nothing. So this was a, a multi-component school-based intervention. We did this in middle schools around the country, and we wanted to decrease the risk factor for type 2 diabetes mellitus, especially in those of low income and those with higher risk for obesity and diabetes. And so with the cluster design, randomly assigned either 42 schools were either assigned to be uh, intervention or control. And we had places around the country, including Philadelphia, where I was, um, Oregon, Texas, UNC was the site. So this, this, this was one where um, it was a three-year intervention. Um, this was a U01. And so we started these children in the beginning of sixth grade. We measured them and then the end of eighth grade. And for those of you who have not yet been involved with the multi-center study, they're really exciting. But also, it took about two years for us to get this going first. So we would meet in Bethesda at the NIH all of the sites all the time, and we'd have to really, really figure out what are we going to do. And we did a pilot, actually, in year one. And so we would meet often. We'd have phone calls every week. This, and so it, it was really very intense to make sure that egos have to be put aside, and we have to do what's best for what our outcome is, and that was to decrease the risk of diabetes in these middle school children. And when you look at some of the schools, they, they were schools that typically did not get a whole lot and typically had a higher rate of obesity. And so what we found overall with some of our results, over 4,000 children participated. They were on eight average 11 years of age, and you can see a high rate of Hispanic, 18% black, and over 50% were girls. And we were a little disappointed with this one as well, because we were hoping we were going to see a greater change with the intervention that we did. And let me stop and tell you the intervention that we did, which I realized I did. We implemented an ecological change in all the intervention schools. That meant that, for example, we revamped their um, everyone's PE classes, and we had an SOP for that. And so every school around the country had to follow that. So before that, that means, by the way, we had to ask every principal to get buy-in to be able to go to their school. And then we had to make sure that all the PE teachers were willing to change. And from there, we then had to make that change because the goal was for them to get 150 minutes of, of being physically active per week. I need to tell you that many of these schools, the kids would be sitting on the side during PE class. So it was not an easy move. So we actually had PE teachers be hired at each of our sites who then worked with the PE teachers within our site so that they could really get to know one another and had buy-in together. Because if we didn't do that, it would again be like, oh, these professors are coming in trying to make a change with us. So that was our physical activity. And then we had dietary changes. So we changed the, uh, the cafeterias within schools to have healthier uh, alternatives to, we changed all of the vending machines to have just water or 1% milk. Um, and then we had, we would have taste tests a lot of, a lot of times with foods that a lot of these kids never saw. So sometimes, you know, we bring kiwi, et cetera. We did different types of, of food so that these children had exposure to types of foods that they never had before. So again, an ecological change where we worked on all of these aspects and we also worked within the health classroom. So we helped, we changed the health curriculum. Um, to make sure that over this three-year period, these, these middle schoolers were getting everything we could thrown at them. And even with that, we didn't see the changes we were hoping to see. What we did see, though, that was really important was that the children who were overweight and obese, we did see a change in the higher-risk children with their waist circumference and with their BMI score. But in a way, that's good, right? We don't want kids who are within a normal BMI Z score or waist circumference to actually lose more weight, especially because they're still growing. So, with that, we also measured uh, insulin and glucose concentrations. We actually brought a van, a, a, a big um, 
you know, one of those mobile homes and we would bring them to the schools, but we only measured them at the beginning of sixth grade and the end of eighth grade because it's hard enough to get into schools, but then when you want to get blood from kids in schools, the IRB gets a little bit more affected, but less the IRB and more the schools. The schools don't want, you know, us coming too often to take blood from their children. So, and I understand that fully. So, um, so this study then, as I was thinking of this study, despite the fact that we didn't see all the changes we wanted to see with such an intense study, that led me to a, a study that we also did in Philadelphia, and it was um, called the Healthy Future Study, and it was uh, funded by Independence Blue Cross Foundation. So for this particular study, we wanted to determine the effects of a three-year multi-component intervention in elementary school kids. So these the children were four to six graders. We wanted to see if we could prevent obesity in these children by another intervention, another sort of ecological intervention. We again measured many things. We measured health behaviors through preferences, but I'm going to focus a bit on the MIZ score and um, waist circumference today as well. This study was a little unique in what we did. So first of all, this is sort of what it looked like across the time. So we would measure them um, beginning and end of every semester, fall, spring, spring um, year two, fall and spring, fall and spring, and then year three, fall and spring. I have to be honest, our year one was not exactly what we wanted because we had to try to get more schools in year one and we were having a tough time getting schools to be part of this study because it was pretty intense for the schools and I'll tell you what the things we did. But with those, we did anthropometrics, we had a, a youth behavior survey questionnaire, and then again, each time we did that, and you can see we had no interventions in the summer, which proved to be a little tough because, you know, these kids then would come back after a summer, and sometimes they would, you know, kind of eat a lot differently in the summer and not have our influence a bit. Um, most of these schools were in Philadelphia, and um, the Philadelphia school system is a system that is very under-resourced. And in the city of Philadelphia, we have a lot of what are called food deserts. So that means that, you know, these kids, when they would go to a corner store, what's, what's available to them is not much healthy stuff. And if you've ever walked in a corner store in a Philadelphia corner store, or maybe in the other city, you see that the cheaper things are the less healthy things, and but that's what the kids go for. And so it's really hard because they're surrounded by this. So this is a quick overview, and then I'll get into a little more detail. But we have we called them core level one and control. That was just what we called them. And the core schools were four schools, and we they received the highest amount of intervention pretty much every week. The level one schools received a moderate amount of uh, intervention about every month, and then the control schools no intervention at all. And so we they were true controls. And this is probably more for me than you because it reminds me of all the schools involved. But you can see we had a combination of public schools, charter schools, and uh, parochial schools. And that kind of will get to my results when we get there. But there, those are just the names of the schools. And, um, and again, it took a little while to get some of that buy-in, which is why year one was not as strong for us as the other two years when they were all with us. So we had these three pillars. We had eat right, get fit, and stay well. And the eat right part, we partnered. So the uniqueness of this study, not because we did it, it's the uniqueness is because we had partners who came in to help us make the environmental change. We were not the ones going in. We had community partners come in and they we oversaw them, of course. And so we had Vetri Foundation for Children, we had Greener Partners and we had Villanova University all helping us with the eating rights. And then to get fit, we had uh, fit essentials, they were called, and I'll tell you that in a minute. The Philadelphia Union um, Major League Soccer Team and then Children's Hospital of Philadelphia was our stay well pillar. So you're gonna see these colors keep coming up. So I was trying not to get too green, and I hope that isn't too green for you. But for the Vetri Foundation for Children, which actually was developed by a chef named Mark Vetri, and what they did, first of all, again, this was pretty intense. So the schools who were in our our core schools had to make a major change in their dining, in their cafeterias. These food service employees had to learn how to make things by scratch. 
And so they, they brought in, you know, fresh chicken, they brought in everything. And then the kids ate family style, and they had it all cleaned up. But eating by scratch, you would say, well, that's not going to be sustainable. Actually, all the foods that they had were USDA approved for the quantity. So it what would have been any different for them. It's the, the quantity. And so that's where people didn't like it so much. But they had what they called eat a kit one to two days per week. And then they had these culinary classrooms, um, four only classrooms per school year, where they came into the classroom and told them about healthy eating, about how that you can cook, et cetera, to try to bring that home. Greener Partners is another is another is a nonprofit as well. And they had monthly in-classroom seed to snack lessons. So they'd come in, the kids would taste different things. The kids would rate about tasting those different things, very basically rating. Right? You'll see the scale. Um, and they had this farm on wheels, and they brought the farm to the, these kids who some of them never saw a farm, and they got their hands dirty, and it was just fun. It was only twice a year, but again, trying to get them connected to food. This is the eat right part. And then Villanova University was sort of not a smaller part in what they did, but from our end they were. But they did some focus groups with the kids and their families about their eating, et cetera. So that was kind of good. So they were pretty intense with that. They had about 10 students per focus group. And then with the physical activity intervention, Pit Essentials was owned by this person, Don Baxter. And Don would go in to each of the four schools and give them an extra 45 minutes a week of physical activity. They called him Superman. They loved him. Um, that doesn't seem like much more. 45 minutes is not like the 150 we did with the healthy study, but we were trying to, again, give them enough that they would be adherent to. And so these kids seemed to think that was good. They also had a takeaway fitness assignment to complete outside of school. And then they had, he tested them on their strengths on their cardiovascular fitness. He would walk tests, push up. The kids had a great time with that. Um, so they really did enjoy that extra sort of 45 minutes a week. And then the Philadelphia Union just came in twice a year and did a pop-up uh, soccer uh, um, you know, field, if you will. And they had two visits with the kids per year. Not that wasn't intense at all, obviously, but just to get the, the children excited. And then CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, their, their school nurse came and did the, the measurements, at least to our four kids students. We did all the other measurements in the, in the other schools. Um, but she also taught my graduate students exactly how she did all the measurements so that all the measurements were the same. So she also formulated a wellness plan for each of the core schools. And then for each of these, you could see that this now is the level one schools that we called. So they got less programming than the other schools got. And so I won't go through each of them, except that you know that again, see, you can see this is per month, the 45 minute, one of the, one of the um, soccer pop-up tents a year. And then the nurse still did the same thing with the uh, level one schools. And then for the control schools, they got no programming at all. They were true control schools. And then we, you know, measured height, body weight, and waist circumference as all of us typically know how. And we did those more than once at each site. Well, you know, height more than once, body weight more than once, and waist circumference we did um, also more than once, one inch above the umbilicus. And through that, of course, we measured BMI, BMI Z score, and waist circumference. And you can see to your right, um, the last column that healthy is less than 85th percentile, overweight and or obese are greater than or equal to the 85th percentile when you're looking at um, the, um, the BMI percentile. And then with waist circumference less than 90th percentile low risk, greater than or equal to the 90th percentile is high risk. As I said, we did a few other measures that I'm not going to share with you, but I just threw them up there to tell you that we, we, in, we use the like the CDC uh, questionnaire for the kids' diet and physical activity, and then we also the Greener Partners had a very basic questionnaire about their food preferences. So this is a simple graph that shows you number of touches, right? So if you look, the core is maroon. You notice my pattern is maroon and orange because that's Virginia Tech's colors. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, go home. So um, core is, you can see how many more times they got interventions compared to level one schools and control schools got nothing, which is why they weren't on this graph at all. And so we had over uh, a total of 523 
participants in this study. Um, and six models were built to describe the influence of level of intervention, sex, school, and school type on either BMI Z scores or waist circumference. And we found that the level of intervention was significant in predicting ZBMI in all students. So that is core was greater than level one, was greater than was greater than control. And so that was good for us. But it also showed us a little bit that core and level one were kind of close. So from a financial and a um, burden standpoint, we don't necessarily need to do all we did in the core to have an effect on these kids' health. And then school type. So what we found here is, and I'll tell you in a second, but the BMIC scores in students who were overweight or or obese were more affected if they were from a parochial school than if they were from the charter or public school. We don't really know why this is. It could be just that it's the area where they are. It could be that, you know, people pay to go to the schools. Or, or is their socioeconomic status higher? We didn't get those data. But um, we, we did see that parochial schools had effect on waist circumference positively and also affected students' cardio, um, cardiovascular or cardiometabolic disease risk, whether they were at high or low risk, if they were in a parochial school. And once again, we did not collect SES data for us to be able to um, look into those more carefully. So we're still working on some of these data, I have to be honest with you, because we're, we're, we're trying to, to um, ensure that we're seeing all of these data correctly. But right now it seems to, it seems like this. It seems that level one and core were both okay, core was a little bit better, and that people who went to the parochial schools seem to do better than those who were in either charter or public schools. Okay. Realize I'm going very fast, but that probably makes you happy because it's 4.30. Um, I just am going to share with you very briefly three other studies we're doing. Well, one is two, two right now, and one that actually we've done a few of these. So in the right-hand corner, you see I have NHANES National Health Nutrition Examination Survey. Three of my doctoral students have done work with NA data. And those of you who are not familiar with that, that's a large database that started probably in the 1950s. And they were they were called the national, uh, they're called NCEP, I'm blanking right now. But those data are free. And so my students have, three of my doctoral students have done work evaluating those data and learning how to use large data sets, which I'm really happy. Um, where we evaluated how magnesium affected diabetes, diabetes risk. So one of my students who literally just defended last July evaluated how different parameters, including magnesium, but things like visceral adiposity index and um, BMI, as well as other indices of fat adiposity, affect diabetes control and management in Asian Americans. And so that was one that we just finished up and we're working on those publications one of my other students worked on one with magnesium and diabetes, as well as another one of my students who worked on one with magnesium and diabetes. They weren't the same two dissertations, I promise, but I'm just counting to the top it. Um, to the top left, that's turmeric. And right now, we're doing a study on turmeric on inflammatory markers and um, antioxidants in college age individuals. And so that study is one of my doctoral students' um, studies where People are just being supplemented for four weeks, and um, they come into our lab, get a blood draw, get a VO2 max, few of VO2 max, get a second blood draw, are given either 300 mg of curcumin, which is the active ingredient of turmeric, 600 milligrams, or a placebo, and then they come back and they get blood draw and VO2 max blood draw. So we're going to evaluate those. I, as I'm getting older, I'm getting much more into inflammation, and so this is why these studies are happening. This study on the bottom, well, this is depicting the fact that we have a study going on with pistachios because I want to match what Jocelyn's doing so that we she, she has almonds, I have pistachios, right? So um, anyway, but um, uh, this study is, we're going to evaluate the effects of either eating pistachios or not um, on inflammation in older adults. Adults who are active 40 to 60 years of age and that this will be a six month study where we will evaluate inflammatory markers, antioxidants, um, minerals, and um, lean body mass to see if it affects lean body mass. So with that, 
Um, I am going to make sure that I, I'm not gonna read all these names, I promise you, but so many people who have been involved in so many studies and many of them my students, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, professors in here know we can't do our work without the wonderful students. I had to put that in, which is pretty cool. And then um, those are actually, I lost my boy bear this year. So yes, he was 12. And um, But Sasha, this is when they were much younger, Sasha to the left is now 14. So, um, but so, but I always love to end with them because of that reaction, um, but I can't take him off yet. So I'm sorry that I can't do it. Um, I know I finished early. I know you're not upset, but I know it will be a question. And I'm really, truly honored to have been invited to such a prestigious place and a sort of humbling to be in front of all of you who are such amazing people. Like who can say they had breakfast with Dr. Booth? You know, I didn't do that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> So thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, John. Like as far as the schools, uh, like as far as the main intervention, is it money? Is it time? Um, you can't just change it. We think the biggest mm -hmm. hurdle is there. I think there's a, a good. I'm going to say yes, yes, and yes, yeah. except that I will say money. And we incentivize them with the healthy study and with the IDC, the interim, the healthy future study, they were incentivized. But again, then we leave. And that's the hard part. But I, I, I would definitely say money. And I'm going to definitely tell you that in Philadelphia schools, it was definitely the case. They were so happy because that was from us. But then we leave. And that's what's hard. But we were trying really hard to, with the, the, the change in them, how they did uh, the cafeterias, to let them know that that would not cost them anymore. But I think then that got the time. So I think everything you said is like exactly true. I would say mine is definitely the highest. Yes. So for your healthy study, you did blood draws in <laughs> began sixth grade and at the end of eighth grade. Yes. And so if I understand correctly, you need to get that approved by IRB then need to get approval at the school, but then I assume it's up to the parents to decide whether they want to opt out, their children opt out or not. So then you had to get each individual parent to basically like include their child or not. Yeah. That, that sounds like that fun? sounds like quite a struggle. How was that? So such a struggle. So not only IRB at the university, Philadelphia school system has, has their own IRB. And their research IRB is even IRB. And yet parents for sure. So yeah. one of my studies, the healthy study actually where they was that there was even though there was, there was no blood draw, sorry, in the the e right study, the, the last one I showed you, it took so long to get through the IRB. But they the nice thing about that was an opt-out. So say you had a child, because yeah. you have dubious consent, the child does the up then. And so um the parent would simply not return. Like if they say yes, we didn't have to see it and then we would see a consent of the children. And that didn't mean that if all of you weren't in the study, you still could get the benefits we just weren't collecting. But thank you for sharing that because yeah, it's not it, it we do and you have to, I mean it took months for us just to meet with all the principals. Um I am such a great project manager, Abby, who Dr. Abby Justine Gilman was on there. Um, just and the constant um, making sure you keep your constant contact with them. The constant sort of like, is there anything we can do? Is what 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 can we do more for you? Can we help you? Like, is there something going wrong? Because if anything does go wrong, especially when you're talking about children, that is like that could just ruin you. And so I constantly tell my students to this day, I have never had an IRB violation. I never will have an IRB violation. And if you do it, it's still on me. So I feel like I'm constantly telling that to be on it. Thank you for recognizing that. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't know who's like that. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious if there was any like financial reimbursement for the college students that got 20% of the students. So that is such a great point, Nada, because we did a very very informal survey that like I don't really like we were just curious did they notice <laughs> they didn't notice but the good news is remember we didn't stop them from the number of times they went up so we couldn't do that right ethically they couldn't do that but it's funny that you say that because they didn't which I'm really glad they didn't notice but 
Do we tell them that did they find out after the fact? No, I didn't. Yeah, I'm sure one of those things where it's like, okay, we're gonna follow you when you're in college to see how you're doing. And um, but it was that I'll tell you, I, I don't know if I said this. I think I had it on my slide, but I failed to say it is I had to go in and my friends had to go in and make sure, like pretty much weekly, are they still adhering to what we ask them to do? Because again, you're asking people to change how they normally do things. And, and as young as some of you are, you have habits that you like to do. So imagine people in that position. So we had a change and then we got to go to the food service and uh, manager to say, hey, can you ask them? Because we never wanted to go directly to, we, we got to know them all, but we didn't want to be like, we're not your bosses. So can you have those smaller? Do you have any study plans or proposals that you put in to have parental involvement increase in your interventions with schools? Like having parents volunteer to run like the activities for the movie classes or having parents come down and like learn how to make the lunches with the lunch staff. Like because I feel like school is like a huge chunk of their day, but the rest of the time presumably is at home. Yeah. And so if you're changing environments, like being able to change school environments, you would think would have the biggest impact. That's a good question. We wrote a grant about that. <laughs> yes, the USDA, we didn't get funded. We were really excited about that. And actually that was one of my students' ideas. I want to get the parents more involved. There is, there is all, and we tried to get them more involved. Like we did try to get them more involved by having certain things go on. But parents are also really busy. So, um, and some of the schools we had, our parents were working three jobs, right? So. I love your, your point is well taken and I agree with it and we try to do that. That doesn't mean we've given up on it. But there's also this fine line between how much we involve the parents because they're so busy and especially for parents of low income who hardly have time that um, there's, there's we need to do a good job. Like we sent home newsletters because I mean I did tell you a lot of things we did with the health study. There are newsletters sent home. We have, have with all the studies we had um, um when they came in, what they told them about like money, my mind. You know, we have like every so often, like where we invited the parents in to kind of update them. Mm -hmm. But you know, not every parent attends. But I love that idea. I'm not putting down that idea. It's just a fine one. It's a tough one. But thank you for asking. And we do try. We'll try again. <laughs> yeah. That's your question. So I, I don't know if I missed it, but was there a way to tease out which intervention was the most effective in terms of like diet, the healthy lifestyle? Well, that's, you go, that's a great question. I'm fine with it. It's going to be a good question. So that's my number one question. Then that's number two question. Just my friends know me as the magnesium guy. I'm putting the magnesium on people. Do you have a favorite form? Yeah. I can answer that quickly. Listening. Okay. All right. That's, Sleep. That's an easy one. Respect. But we tested that. I did a study, uh, which I didn't show, magnesium on metabolic syndrome. So that was a big infusion study. Um, supplementation, double blind study, and um, magnesium glycinate actually is the best of your. We tested it not just on ourselves, but on our participants, and it doesn't cause diarrhea. Yeah. yeah. But yet, hospitals did sulfate, which is diarrhea, causes diarrhea. Yeah. yeah. yeah don't, uh, don't get me started. I love it. magnesium guy. What's your name? Dane. Dane. Okay. D A N E. Yeah, I am. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. First part of your question, which is the more, the more serious part, I'm not debating it. We didn't, we couldn't tease it out because we were actually trying to give that as a full intervention, even with the healthy study. And we talked about that in the healthy study group, we talked about that in our IV, I keep saying IVC, independent food trial fund. Do we consider making more groups and looking at, okay, is it just diet? But we really want to do that full ecological change within the schools. So we made that decision to do that. And so it is really hard because we couldn't team one or the other out. But thanks. All of your questions have been great. I, you should never say that's a great question, but all of them have been good. <laughs> I want to make sure you understand. You could, you could ask me something like about the mitochondria since you don't work. If you could redo the intervention, however, like knowing what you know now, how would you, is there something that you could have done that would optimize it further? Mm -hmm. Or just more intervention, just more? Yeah, I think I appreciate that. And do you, do you, would you say any of those, any of the environmental change studies? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I would say number one, I would involve the parents more, but in a way that was a good involvement and not too much. Um, I would, or if I specifically said the IBC study, I feel like if we had had the um, cafeteria intervention more often, I think that could have helped the students more. A lot of these students, like they they were on free lunch, free breakfast, right? So their their home meals were not the best, right? So they would go home and I mean some of the things that you see and some homes do not have refrigerators. And so like these kids were not having the best of that. So if we could have maybe implemented that more, I would have liked to see that. With the uh, record with the university study, um I I wish we could have had um, a little more control over some of the portion sites. So like a lot of it was changed, but not if. So if we could have changed everything, if I could have come in and had the smaller glasses, that would have been helpful. Because again, even if they went more often, they still got less over, over time. But it's hard with environmental change. It's, it's, it's difficult to do. It's wonderful if it works. I still believe that it can work because I feel like we've done so much education and that's not working. Thank you. Thank you. Director. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic talk. That was, that was excellent. I, I'm thinking about your study that's funded by the Frogs, and are you going to be able to tease out what might be predictors of response and non response? You're like lumping schools together, but at the individual student level, will you have socioeconomic status? Will you have some predictors? That build into it. I'm, I don't know if there were any sex differences or if there were any ethnicity differences or race differences that could say who, who responded well versus who did it. Um, you said the charter schools did better than some of the other the, the so, programs. Yeah, the programs yeah. did. So are, are you going to be able to dice that down as I'm thinking about precision health and instead of just, just let's throw all the kids in the same bucket? Are we going to be able to kind of tease this out and have enough power to think about what might predict the response in the industry? I think again, here's what's difficult, but I think it's still okay. You know, we all everything was anonymous, right? We did not so, but I still think it's okay, right? We can still probably do those predictors because we do have race and ethnicity and sex. Um, we didn't get SES. We could do this though. You know, you can get general SES by getting zip codes, right? So if we get zip codes, we get general SES of kids who were, you know, in those areas. I think we could. The predictive prediction models that our statistician made were not as involved with what you're asking. So I think we can do it. And I appreciate you asking that. Because I think we need to do that. You're right, for precision health. I don't know why you would say that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Don't you think that's great? Because that's the record. Just leave me on Um, I think you both had your questions. Okay, very quick question. In either the healthy study or the healthy nutrition study, did you find fantasy? Oh, that's a great question. So, not in healthy teachers, but yes, in the healthy. Okay. Yes, we did. So, we did. Very good. Yes, yeah. can't we take that? And, and we probably should have in the healthy futures. We did it because, I mean, that doesn't really matter. They were younger and less likely of puberty than the six to eight graders. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have, but we did. Since most of the interventions with the school was on a potential breakfast and lunch, did those include, or maybe this future direction, where you include foods that are more uh, satiating, like more than these more fruit, maybe by high school though, so they when they go home, they're not having, you know, a whole lot of food. So in the school, in the school studies, does the middle and elementary school, we did change what we offered. What was hard was we still couldn't totally get rid of, right, the choice. Um, so they had, to, so we, we made sure that the choices were better most of the time. But yes, and, and you're going to laugh. Even things like we had whole wheat pizza or whole wheat corn dogs, right? Like so, <laughs> I know. So you still tried to make it fun for these kids. Marge. 
Exactly. And also it helped them to choose. So we were, so we, what we did was, which again, I didn't tell you this, what we did was we did see like collect the data on when, when they like, um, what do you call it? When, when they went through, you could see what they bought. And so we were collecting the data on that. We didn't actually publish any of that, honestly. So I can't really tell you the data on that, but for the healthy study, we did that. If those interventions like disproportionate size were actually larger, so they only have the intervention twice versus like three or four day. So you mean larger, healthier interventions, but uh, inner foods rather. Right. So the the female cells would have less of an effect. That's actually a good thought. Yeah, that would be good because then it's like, oh, here's more broccoli. <laughs> you can have all of it. <laughs> and these things are not important. <laughs> but no, that is actually a really good thought. Clever. Maybe that'll get busted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Um, out of ignorance, what is your take on, um, I say, in body school, totally gearing for the choice of muscle um, on top of BMI or weight or something? Because it's particularly gearing for the young or the growing individual. I'm just wondering you know, how you think about it. As in an end, end point or the point of measure, as in a specific um, in outcome. So, what are you, the beginning you said, what do I think of? Oh, the in body school, the like in body this, the, 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 oh, the, the in body machine. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. What do I think of it? Yes, the, the, the measurement of a BIN. Like, yeah, the skeletal muscle as the yeah, um, indicative measure of, 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 of fatness as opposed to as opposed to BMI. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, What's nice about BMI Z score, just to step back for a second, is you know, it really puts them on a relative to others and it's not really looking at just your BMI. Right. So I like that, as you yeah. know, you know that. Yeah. So, but what I don't like about BMI in general, and all of you probably agree with this, is it's a great public health tool because, on the average, people who have a high BMI on average, right, are probably fatter and have more adipose tissue than those who maybe are athletic. I think in body's okay. We have that as one of our measures. Um, we have the DEXA, we have the bipod, and I know you um, all do too. Um, but from, from a speed standpoint, not everybody can get a DEXA. I think that the in body's okay because it does, you know, more than just stepping on a scale. And I do think it's a, a better BIA. I still had a little trouble with BIA, you know, because of sometimes the measurement is how hydrated you are, but you point it right, right. But it's but you're just more talking about lean body mass, and yeah. is that right? You're just asking that. I think if we had a better measure of just skeletal muscle, I think that would be great. I do think it's harder from a public health standpoint. Yeah, and thank you for fixing my slide. Yeah, I appreciate that you did that. You did it very, very, very quietly, but I know this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for such a great presentation. I'm, I'm very fascinated by the human study because I'm Indian. And as you know, you know, we have uh, turmeric in our cuisine. And so when we cook with turmeric, it's not just turmeric, it's you know, peppers and garlic and other spices. And so I'm not I'm not very familiar with the 15 minute research, but I'm wondering if if you think that the benefit of cooking in the meat pans with the addition of other active ingredients found in. Oh, that's it. You know, you're, you're setting me up. <laughs> no, well, you know, black pepper enhances absorption. We're, of course, using a supplement, and we're using a supplement. Um, and I'm so embarrassed that I can't remember the name of it, but it actually has does have lipid in it and has a little black pepper in it that enhances absorption. So we chose this supplement, yeah, and we chose it based on other studies which compared our supplement that we're using to others. And, we're not getting funded by this company at all, but we just wanted to make sure we were providing them with a supplement that was um, very bioavailable. Um, a, a couple of things that you may need to think about, and that is one, turmeric we know is amazing, but honestly, to get the effects to just sprinkle it on is not going to give us the effects in the supplement, even though I prefer to tell people just sprinkle it on. Number two, we wanted to see the dose response. So we wanted to be really aware of, is it going to be, is it going to be effective at a lower dose or at a higher dose? We don't know, but we were hoping that 
you hope to be seen in person, you just don't know if you will. And it's very short term because many of the studies in term range were very short term. So we kind of parallel them, but the VO2 max on either end is something different than others have done. So how long is it? It's just four weeks. So they're on it, whatever they get, you know, randomly, they're on it for four weeks because they come in the beginning, blood draw, VO2 max, blood draw, the end, blood draw, VO2 max, blood draw. And we're measuring um, antioxidants and inflammatory markers. And we're measuring lean body mass, but just at the beginning for a marker because four weeks won't tell us anything. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking about pistachio studies. That just so one of my food scientist colleagues is going to be testing the antioxidants in my pistachios over time to make sure that they sort of are maintained since the antioxidants is something that we're evaluating. So I'm, and it's kind of exciting because his, his angle is that way, whereas my angle is on the health of the person. So it's kind of neat. A neat match because I know you guys just combine the design. So there's kind of two things you can do. I know it's time. But are there any other questions? You guys were amazing, and I really hope that you weren't bored. Do you have a question? It's not a question. I just want to say how amazing it was for my lunch with you today. Your sense of humor is amazing. <laughs>